Hello, everyone. I'm Steve Plach, and welcome to this edition of Nonprofit Spotlight. As you all know, uh, Nonprofit Spotlight is a production of the Volunteer Advisory Committee here at, at uh, Community Television. And uh, we, like you, are sheltering in place. We're hoping you're all safe and, and maintaining uh, your social distancing and all the things that are going to help us get through this particular pandemic. But even though we're all sheltering in place, uh, that doesn't prevent us from continuing to produce quality programming. What we thought we would do uh, with the uh, nonprofit spotlight is produce a series of shows that highlight, of course, the local nonprofits, but how they are getting through uh, the sheltering in place and the pandemic themselves and how it's affecting their ability to pursue their mission. So the very first program is today, the one you'll see uh, eventually when it gets onto the air. And uh, we're very, very pleased to have with us, this is Save Our Shores, one of my very favorite organizations. And we have their executive director, Catherine O'Shea. Catherine, welcome. Thank you, Steve. It's really a delight to be here, especially as your first, you know, your first featured organization. I feel honored. Absolutely. Well, uh, why don't we get started by uh, telling uh, our viewers uh, a little bit about yourself and how you became involved with the Save Our Shores. Yeah, well, um, I have been a long, long time advocate of the environment. I've worked in corporate sustainability, mm. uh, conservation and ocean conservation on both coasts. So I'm, I'm, I'm bi-coastal. I don't do the middle of the country, but I, I have to be near. <laughs> Um, you know, I think I came to Save Our Shores. I knew of the organization when I had lived in San Francisco um, about 20 years ago. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I was very fond of what the mission was at the time, but ended up going back to the East Coast for a while. And then I found myself kind of looking for a change. And uh, obviously Save Our Shores was in a, a time of transition as well. And I happened to see the uh, recruitment notification and I applied. Um, and, you know, sort of the rest of that is history. I was offered a position and I moved from Rhode Island, the oh my. state, mm -hmm. all, right. <laughs> uh, all the way back across country wow. um, to Santa Cruz. And, you know, I really wanted to take this role because I've worked in so many different aspects of, of environmental protection and conservation. The ocean is most important to me. And mm -hmm. I think it's our most vital natural resource. And, you know, as I sort of get further down in my career, I wanted to be sure to spend some part of it just completely focused on taking care of that most important life-giving resource that this planet offers us. I mean, the ocean is the reason we can even have life on Earth. We're no, no, yeah, so. no question about it. You know, the uh, Save Our Shores is, is really lucky and very fortunate to have you and, and certainly welcome to, uh, to this coast. Uh, I, I know that the stewardship of the Monterey Bay National Marine Sanctuary is really foremost in uh, uh, Save Our Shores mission. Uh, and I did notice on the website, uh, 40 years, uh, for Save Our Shores, and I was telling you earlier that I'm proud to be a uh, Sanctuary Steward graduate 2009, so I'm having done some, some work myself, but give us a little bit of uh, history about the organization, not the whole 40 years maybe, but just a little taste of, of you know, what, what, what the history is like. Yeah, well, that's, um, that's a great question to ask. And, you know, the website is still sort of touting our 40 plus years. This is actually our 42nd year. Oh, fantastic. I, I yeah. think it just was 42. We were uh, uh -huh. created as an organization in 1978, in April of 1978. So we and it doesn't look a day over 39. No. <laughs> 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 Great. <laughs> so, um, yeah, so 1978 was a very different time. The um, yes. oil and gas industry was chomping at the bit to start drilling offshore here. We know, um, you know, what happened in Santa Barbara, and that caused a lot of consternation. And when uh, oil and gas industry had their sights on the Monterey shores, Monterey Bay shores, um, or waters, I should say, mm -hmm. um, 
and a small group of very active grassroots organizers got together and said, no way, no how, not in our Monterey Bay. And Wonderful. began a, a campaign and ingeniously came up with a solution. Um, they were not able to, you know, get the government to shut down the possibility of leasing uh, to the oil and gas companies, offshore leases. But what they cleverly did was get ordinance, ordinances passed in 26 coastal communities up and down the coast of California that um, banned the development of onshore infrastructure that would be required to support the offshore drilling. Mm -hmm. and by doing that, they made it very unattractive and, and and not very cost effective for the oil companies to want to set things out. And so Save Our Shores had, you know, a pretty quick victory. I'm sure it took, you know, seven, eight, ten years until they they, you know, completely won that. Um, but that was the start of Save Our Shores. And then having achieved that, we became very engaged with other community leaders and uh, then um, I, I guess he was representative or I'm not sure if he was representative or Senator Leon Panetta at the time mm -hmm. yeah. uh, uh, worked with, you know, local leaders to create the Monterey Bay National Marine Sanctuary to get our, our waters designated as a marine sanctuary by an act of Congress, which gives us an extra measure of protection compared to some of the other national marine sanctuaries. Well, having accomplished that, we set out to look at any threat to the Monterey Bay and put activities and programs in place to literally save our shores from any threat right. that comes our way. Yeah. And justifiably so, Save Our Shores continues to have the support of many uh, elected officials and, and community uh, folks. Uh, Mark Stone, in fact, at my, my time at Save Our Shores was a uh, supervisor and he's assembly person now and uh, is on, was on the board and is a very big supporter, of course, of Save Our Shores as Bill Monning, our local senator, and John Laird. Folks like that uh, have really supported the organization over time. So uh, we're delighted to really be able to do that and provide that kind of essential support. And it's fascinating you talk about the very creative solutions to really monumental problems like, you know, oil drilling and that. That's a testament really to the people at Table Our Shores has had over the years and you're part of that legacy now. Uh, let me turn now to uh, uh, something we really want to talk about. Uh, your present programs at Save Our Shores, in, in my experience, and, and, uh, and I think people People understand that a lot of the work you do really depends on the community engagement, community involvement, a lot of socialization, the very things that we that we can't do now. Uh, How is that impacting your ability to kind of pursue your mission and continue with the beach cleanups, river cleanups, the dock walking, all the programs that you have? Yeah, well, that's been quite a challenge. I mean, as you so rightly said, we, you know, we do a lot of our work in the field. We're out there literally saving our shores. So we've had to get very creative and, you know, and pivot and try and work with our partners. So, um, you know, the county of Santa Cruz, we have a contract with them to, to clean 50 county, well, there aren't 50 county beaches, but we clean county beaches 50 times over the year. And, you know, usually that was through a, a public cleanup with, you know, anywhere from five or six to a hundred volunteers. Which really, yeah. Now, you know. Mm -hmm. We've set up a program where we're working with individuals, encouraging individuals to go out on their own. And there's many in this community who are willing to get out there and no, absolutely yeah. by themselves use, mm -hmm. in fact, um, you know, a, a an application, a mobile application that you can download on your phone, which was developed by a colleague of yours and a great volunteer to save our shores, Keith Budger. Absolutely, yeah. Um, <laughs> and, you know, we, we make sure they understand how to use that app and we give them all the safety instructions and, and extra protocols related to the shelter in place and social distancing. And mm -hmm. we are able to continue to keep our shores clean by having these individual, either staff members or our volunteers, 
get out there and clean the beaches and still track the data so that we, we know what we're picking up and we know how many pounds of trash and recycling, et cetera, et cetera, and what kinds of items we're finding. And, um, you know, we're also encouraging any group, whether it's a family or, you know, a small group of, of roommates who are already sheltering in place, who are kind of that shelter in place unit to mm -hmm. go and, and do the cleanups also. And so we're, you know, we're seeing a number of people step up to do that. And I think that's testament to how much, you know, this community loves our ocean backyard. No question. And are people able to, if they want to uh, go and clean up the beaches and rivers and do the things that uh, we, that you've historically done, are they able to stop by your office out there at the Yacht Harbor and pick up materials or no, that can't, you can't do that? Yeah, we can't do that. But, you know, a lot of people have volunteered so often to save our shores. You'll be amazed how many people have their own reusable gloves. Oh, wonderful. Yeah. And grabbers, you know, the long grabbers and buckets. And, you know, I mean, they, they've outfitted themselves. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, it, it, it makes it does make it a little bit more difficult. And then, you know, now with people disposing of PPE, you know, their the gloves and their masks, it's getting a little bit more hazardous for our volunteers. So we have to add additional protocols to make people, you know, be very careful. If you pick up any of these materials, we're encouraging that they use grabbers and not just gloves. It's probably safe with just gloves, but we don't want to take any chances with our, our volunteers. And so we urge them to use grabbers and make sure that they dispose of it immediately in the trash and, you know, make sure that they understand that's not recyclable material, even though it is a plastic. So, yeah, it's it's been getting more and more complicated, but, um, you know, we keep working our way through it. Right. Well, it's an interesting kind of byproduct of the pandemic that, you know, in my day, people, uh, would go, you know, pick things up off the beach and, and do that kind of uh, personal picking. But I think the grabbers is a wonderful way to actually get people incorporated into the idea of doing that because it is a terrific way to pick up the very, you know, very small pieces. I wanted yeah. to ask you one thing about uh, moving to kind of the future plans. Uh, one of the things that I enjoyed most about being a sanctuary steward was doing beach cleanups with school age children. And now, of course, you know, the, the, the children have not been in school. They haven't been involved in regular programs. It, has there been any discussion at all about maybe getting the kids back out somehow? Yeah, well, that I don't think is going to happen for quite a long time, even as mm -hmm. we, you know, we do a lot of education programs. So we used to go into the classrooms quite right. a bit. We would do a, a three-part program where we would have two classroom sessions, and in between those two, uh, you know, that were the educational uh, and, and activity based um, segments of the program, we would do a field trip where we would get the kids out to the beach, sometimes to do a beach cleanup, often to clean up, sometimes to go tide pooling or sometimes to just explore and, and discover the wildlife that lives on our coast. But we're not going to be able to do that. Even as they talk about reopening schools, they're talking. Mm -hmm. That's why I mentioned it. Yeah. Trips. Yeah. yeah. And, but I have a very clever staff member who's our education coordinator. And she said, I'm going to make. You can mention her by name. You want a little shout oh, out? Sure. Uh, Krista Rogers. She's oh, been Krista. Um, <laughs> just about a year. Um, and she had this idea to go do a virtual beach field trip. Oh my gosh. Okay, well, good luck with that. I couldn't, I personally couldn't get my head around. How are you going to do this? She <laughs> fabulous video. It's so engaging. When I first saw it, I was sitting, I was having breakfast with my husband and, and he started watching it. And uh -huh. she did the different things to look for on the beach. And then she does a little beach cleanup. And, and I was sitting there like, Oh, that's a cigarette butt. <laughs> oh, look, rapper, you know, I mean, I was so engaged myself and um, I don't know if you have the capability of showing it. It's it's a video that we could share with you if it's something you'd like to bring out to the community. But it is a really wonderful piece of work. And we've been, you know, really pivoting to develop these kinds of video and virtual programs. And in fact, we just got a grant to develop a uh, a 3D virtual dive experience My goodness. Yeah. into our, our marine protected areas. 
it's going to be a little bit more challenging uh, how we go about that because ideally kids would use a viewing device to get that 3D dimension. And, you know, we're thinking through how to do that, but we're very excited about that. Um, and, and we will be starting work on that as soon as our first uh, part of the grant funding comes in next month. Well, that's wonderful. And it, certainly grant funding is a part of the way that you raise money. But there's also an opportunity on your website, saveourshores.org, to donate. So we really urge people, if they want to get involved in some tangible way now with a couple of extra dollars they may not be spending doing something else, you know, direct that to Save Our Shores way. Well, we would certainly appreciate that. You know, it's it's interesting. You know, we have this conversation about essential and non-essential workers. Mm hmm you know, kind of unfortunately, and, and maybe rightly so, we're kind of a non-essential nonprofit right now in terms of where uh, philanthropists are, are focusing their money. You know, there's so, there's so much need for uh, funding um, for the health service providers, social mm -hmm. service providers, the homeless, you know, the food banks. Um, a lot of money is being raised and, and directed there um, and we've seen some of our traditional uh, funders uh, just say, we're sorry this year, you know, focus our money on food banks and, and you know, underserved health providers and, and things like that. And we understand that, but, you know, it, it, it's important to re remember that our environment is really incredibly essential. Um, no question. Yeah. You do a, essential work, even though it might not be a directly impacting people affected by COVID right now. Um, you know, as we get back out in the world, we need to ramp up our protection of our environment because if you if you trace things back, you know, this pandemic, climate change, these these you know monumentally scary things that are happening to us really kind of go back to how we treat our planet and, and we haven't treated it very well for, for quite a long time. So we need to learn um, that that's going to be really important to keep us healthy going forward. Well said, and I'm hoping that the community members will remember Save Our Shores and maybe, you know, throw a dollar or two uh, that way while they're, you know, also uh, seeing that uh, the, the city and county and folks uh, are really spending an awful lot of money uh, during the pandemic helping the people who are traditionally underserved and who really need our help at this point. So, but the environment remains an important and crucial aspect of our lives, and we really have to keep that in mind. I did want to ask you one thing that I mentioned earlier and this has to do with kind of the pandemic we're seeing now. One of the major initiatives for Save Our Shores over the years, and even during my time, was the elimination of plastic pollution from our, from our ocean environment. But now we see a lot more plastic uh, being used. Uh, what, what's your view of that? Yeah, well, it's, you know, it's, it's disconcerting. It's, you know, it's um, kind of a bit scary. But it's also understandable, right? I mean, everybody is so scared. Um, you know, the way the the, the very um, uncoordinated handling of this virus across the country, with governors kind of left on their own to make decisions. You know, we've seen we we have such a, a mismatch of of you know different shelter in place rules and regulations and yeah. running up and who's not and you know, I mean, it's it's understandable. There's so much we still don't know about the virus that, you know, at, at this point, we're we're kind of monitoring the situation, mm -hmm. we're not backing off of our anti-plastic pollution. Standards. Absolutely, yeah. But, you know, we also don't want to be tone deaf at this time. You know, I think of the grocery store workers. I mean, everybody worries about the medical. Um, personnel, you know, the doctors and nurses who are right, right on the front line. But I think of our grocery stores and our pharmacy workers as, you know, sort of heroes, you know, themselves at risk every day so that we can go and buy our food and, you know, and, and, and beverage and household needs and sanitizers and, and what have you. And if they feel feel safer, you know, not having someone bring in their reusable bags that may or may not be properly sanitized. I think we have to be tolerant of that in the short term. But I think, you know, if we see 
too much of it happening or we really see, you know, industry is out there kind of trying to take advantage of this moment and saying that reusables are less safe. I mean, disposables are left less safe than the reusables. Mm -hmm. no. Let me get this right. <laughs> yeah, please. <laughs> we <are done. laughs> industry, the plastics industry is out there trying to tell people that that reusables and disposables are less, no, that disposables are safe and reusables are not safe. I see, right. Yeah. So, um, you know, and that's across the board as we see restaurants starting to open up. There was even CDC guidelines just came out that they're recommending restaurants go to uh, disposable dinnerware, utensils, right. menus, even tablecloths, which is a little bit, you know, kind of really that takes me aback. We need to watch that one carefully because there's kind of no real scientific basis for right. that. Um, but again, we don't want to be tone deaf, tone deaf while people are really right. scared and frightened and we, we don't have all the facts. So, um, but we are continuing to monitor this and I'm pleased to say in Santa Cruz County, there's still an interest in uh, helping to mitigate plastic pollution and um our zero waste manager at the county, Tim Goncharoff, is wonderful guy. Tim, a shout out to him. Fabulous, yeah, he's my go-to guy for what's uh -huh. happening around legal um, ordinances in in the county. Mm -hmm. He scheduled to present to the board of supervisors next month on some additional uh, plastic recommendations. Um, now he was supposed to do that back in. I think it was March, and you know, given COVID just came on the scene, they. Right. they own that, but it's been rescheduled for June and, and hopefully that will go forward. And, you know, depending on how safe I feel at the time, I'll likely be at the Board of Supervisors meeting and encouraging them to keep going and take continued action. We're very fortunate here in Santa Cruz to have the Board of Supervisors that we have who have really been on the forefront of plastic pollution ordinances and, and well. Yeah, we're fortunate as a community uh, to have uh, strong advocates like yourself and like Tim and, and your staff as well to remind people about the, 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 the distinctions in plastic, you know, and, 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 and what we need to do, but what we still need to be mindful of. And I, I think that's important for that education process to continue, and I'm certain that you and your staff are continuing to do that. Yeah, and I think we'll probably ramp up a little bit more education in terms of what's safe and not safe in, in, the, COVID, in the COVID world. Um, right. and, and while still trying to understand that a lot of people are, are scared and frightened and they just want to do what's right, but sure. we see a horrible proliferation of plastic as a result of this. When you look at all of the PPE equipment, uh, so much of that has turned to plastic over the years. And, you know, it's, it's, it's going to be mind boggling how much plastic is out there after this. Yeah, that's unfortunate, particularly in consideration of all the great work and advocacy that's been done over time. We seem to be taking, you know, uh, the one step and two steps forward, but now maybe a little step back and we're going to have to kind of uh, uh, re, you know, recoup and figure out what's going on, particularly with Save Our Shores it being, uh, you know, the elimination of plastic pollution in the marine environment is just a, such a huge issue for you. Uh, we have about five minutes left. I want to make sure that we remind people again saveoarshores.org go on the website uh, you know contribute to what you can how else can people during this time become involved with with being stewards of the marine environment as, as you all are there at Save Our Shores yeah well I mean I think a really great way is for you know people to step up and do some of these individual or, or small shelter in place group cleanups of ah, our uh -huh. Um, you know, they aren't getting as trashed as much as they used to because we're not supposed to be going to the shores in as large numbers as we were. Right. Uh, in a sense, that's a good thing. But, you know, we still, every time somebody does a cleanup, it's still a significant amount of trash that we're picking up. And there's kind of legacy trash out there that we're still removing. Mm -hmm. uh, 
know, be safe, but be willing to, to get out there and love your shore and, and help clean it. Um, you know, if, if people have creative ideas, I mean, we're in the, we're entering a, a, a planning process, a scenario planning process to sort of like, what is the look, world going to look like after right. And how do we best deliver on our mission in a, in a post coronavirus world, you know, is it going to be virtual education for a long time? You know, is are we not going to be able to interact, interact directly with the kids? I mean, you know, there's so many unknowns So we're, we're starting a process to figure that out and, you know, welcome uh, creative citizens. <laughs> Email yeah. me, you know, my email is on the website. They should feel free oh, to send yeah. some ideas. Um, you know, obviously financial support is always helpful and important. Um, and just, you know, continue to love our ocean backyard. It's why we all live here, right? And Right, boy, no question. But you and your staff, of course, are going to be kind of the architects of this strategic plan moving forward about, you know, what the what the world's going to look like and the part of the world that's our national marine sanctuary environment. Uh, it's so important, you know, to really be able to move forward you know, quickly when the opportunity presents itself. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, especially around our advocacy work, as soon as it makes sense, as soon as, you know, there's sort of uh, a leveling off of of the you know the the panic out there over the pandemic and and what's happening. We we'll be hitting it hard. We were prepared to to do a petition to try and get um, signatures, almost like a ballot initiative, but without officially going to put it on the ballot. But to mm-hmm. get the the voice of of their constituents uh, to the board of supervisors that. We don't want beverages sold in single-use plastic bottles anymore. So we would right. launch a, a ban plastic bottles petition so that we could collect this constituent um, input and bring it to the supervisors and urge them to take action without us having to go to a ballot measure, which is a very expensive, way more expensive. Indeed, than it is having had experience that. Um, but, you know, we have to pull that. We can't be on the streets asking people to sign a petition. We'll probably launch one online. And that's another way people can help right now is, you know, watch for these sort of things on our website and sign on to these kinds of petitions. And as soon as we can get back out there into the public, we'll be collecting hard signatures and, and talking and educating the public about all the work we still have left to do in the, in the plastics area. Well, wonderful. Well, Catherine, it's been wonderful talking to you. Thank you so much for your great work and your staff's great work in protecting our marine environment. I look forward to being able to get uh, back out to the beach. I look forward to be able to do a little beach cleanup myself at some point, and maybe I can get on the website and uh, generate some uh, uh, some funds uh, to really see that this work is being done. But anyway, uh, Santa Cruz is very fortunate to have you. Again, welcome to our community. Thank you for your great work. And uh, we'll be talking to you soon. Uh, I've been Steve Plach, and this has been uh, Nonprofit Spotlight. 